I'm so excited today to have with me uh, my martial arts instructor and one of the mentors in my life, uh, Senior Grandmaster James Bailey. Uh, this year celebrates 40 years of uh, Mr. Bailey being in the Tuscaloosa and Norport area teaching martial arts and uh, in a way of thinking what can we do to celebrate, what can we do to benchmark uh, this historical year, because how many, first off, how many small businesses operate for 40 years consistently? Um, but really, the picture is way bigger than just what's happened here in Tuscaloosa. And so, how do we get that across? How can we tell that story? I want my kids to know the story. I want all of my students to know the story. Um, and he's affected so many people across the country uh, just, just to be able to share that. And so, I just asked him, I said, Sir, would you be willing to sit down with me and do a podcast type format? to be able to talk about the last 40 years, his life, the martial arts, what's changed, all the people that have come through Tuscaloosa that now are all over the country uh, teaching martial arts themselves. And so he, he hesitantly <laughs> agreed to do that because uh, he's one of the most humble people also. And so for him to talk about himself is very difficult. And so I'm just excited that we've got him. Uh, we've got the set kind of set up with things from across the past 30 to 40 years, we've got old manuals, we've got stuff off of old uniforms, we've got old trophies that we don't use anymore, things that we're going to talk about through this. But uh, first off, sir, thank you so much for sitting down with me. And, uh, you know, first off, what led you to want to be a martial artist? And I know there's a backstory with that. And so what is it that, that really kind of hooked you before even thinking about being an instructor, any of the things that have come with that. So pre-1981, when you moved to Tuscaloosa, what hooked you on the martial arts? Well, first of all, thanks for wanting to do this. I mean, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm pleased to try to sit down and do that. And um, there would be no story if you weren't surrounded by such wonderful people for those 40 years. So, uh, you know, just want to say that first, that I've been tremendously impacted by not only my instructor and the people around me, but the students that I've been fortunate to work with, their parents, and then it just goes from instructor on, on and on. But, you know, I was an athlete in high school and I just love sports. I love competition. Uh, you know, I played football, baseball, and basketball through those years. and. You know, naively, I think um, if you're able to score a few touchdowns in high school, you start to think that you might be able to continue that after high school's over. But obviously, I didn't realize that a, you know, five foot eight, um, 130 pound guy graduating high school probably wasn't going to play uh, college football anywhere. So um, after that dream kind of went away, I started trying to find something to be competitive. You know, what can I compete in? and train and get excited. And I had a friend in 1977 that introduced me to martial arts. It was a different martial art, but just the structure and the discipline that was going on in that room just reminded me of my football coaches, just the structure and discipline that we had each day, what you were required to do, um, you know, just leadership, following someone's instruction and seeing what the results would be. So I agreed to go take a lesson or two, and then I stumbled across my instructor one day and uh, found his name in the yellow pages as I looked. And some people, Michael, might not know what yellow pages are, but, but that tells you the story. So um, in 77 and 78, uh, I was searching out that opportunity and went to, uh, funny little tidbit of that, I've, I made the appointment. I went to take that first class. I looked in through the glass before I walked in. There's nothing but adults out there in these white pajama looking things and I just froze. So I chickened out and I turned around and went home. But fortunately, uh, Mr. Collars, Craig Collars, gave me a call and said I missed my appointment and he would like to see me. Went back in and uh, that was it. Just so competitive there in that room and watching people uh, excel and push themselves and, and, and goodness, Mr. Collars was such an example of a physical martial artist. I was so impressed by that, that uh, it hooked me. So I, I love the fact that uh, by his instructor who trained him in business, who trained him to come here and open up a school, by his instructor, it's the same thing, a lot of people that are going to watch this are actually career martial artists that, that Mr. Bailey's influenced by his instructor actually doing 
what he trains his own business people to do is if somebody doesn't show up for an appointment, you call them. And so by him doing that, the rest is history of 40 years. If he had not made that phone call, then this might not be happening. And so um, just a neat look, that, that's, that's really neat. And, and the fact that even our instructor, the first time that, that he was gonna go take a class was a little intimidated by that. Just speaks to all of our current students or people that have trained in the past. Um, get your foot in the door the first time and um, just let us work from there. But you do you know, make that first step to actually come in uh, and make that happen. So uh, you trained under now Senior Grandmaster Craig Collars at the time was like a second or third degree, something like that maybe. Uh, it was a long time ago. He was ago. always a ninth degree to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so came in, trained under him and the instructors that he had there at the school in Birmingham. Right. Uh, and so again, the, the history is Mr. Grandmaster Bailey is from Birmingham, the West Jefferson area. Uh, and so trained in Birmingham, was a student in Birmingham. And then what was the transition where Mr. Collars was like, hey, Bailey, let's go to Tuscaloosa, because I know there's a story there. So how did that happen? And then how did you end up in Wood Square, which is now a, a, not Wood Square anymore. The Lofts Apartments are sitting there, but yeah. that used to be Wood Square right there on 13th Street in McFarland in Tuscaloosa. Just a little bit of the story of how you went from being a student slash instructor to then, hey, let's go open up an academy for you. Yeah. Well, that started by uh, getting hired at the academy and I was selling suits in Century Plaza, which is no longer there anymore. This was in the Eastwood side of uh, Birmingham. And uh, Mr. Collars and one of his instructors came to buy suits one day from me. They knew I worked at this uh, retail store there in, in Birmingham. So I measured them for a suit and we did all the tailoring and all the measuring and all of the things that you do. And he said, look, um, after we buy this suit, why don't you come to work for me? And it took me about five seconds to say, uh, when do I start, sir? And I was a red belt at that time and uh, he s invited me to come work for him. And so naturally that was, um, little did I know, that was the start to the greatest job in the, on the planet, and I got to be a part of it. So uh, I went to work for him. He just added a full line of uh, Nautilus strength training equipment at that time. So I spent more time than I would like over on the Nautilus side of the facility, but as time went on, I got to do more and more classes uh, as I earned my black belt. And then he allowed me to open up a club a satellite of his location down in my hometown. And I was hooked at that point, uh, obviously being able to share this great activity that I was doing uh, with the people that uh, I knew, played sports with. Uh, my brother even started and became a black belt in our, in our system. And um, it just, you know, it was just a great opportunity, but one day out of the blue, I came into work. I mean, that's how I'm literally, I came into work one day and he said, uh, would you be interested in running the school in Tuscaloosa for me? And I said, uh, yes, sir, when? And he said, get your stuff. We're on our way to Pensacola to pick up some things. So that's, uh, we drove to Pensacola. We spent the night with uh, Mr. Burt Collars. Mr. Collars had then uh, built a facility that he was moving into, so the remnants left of that old uh, first Burt Collars Academy. I took everything that we could take. The, we rolled up carpet, bag gloves that he had worn out uh, that became my bag gloves. And I was on a U-Haul two days later by myself driving back to Tuscaloosa where he had already signed the lease that I didn't know about. Wow. Um, so just like that, hey, I'm moving to Tuscaloosa. Uh, and so the location is there, you get there. We've heard the stories, I've heard them, but everybody watching this may not have heard them. Um, tell us about what the first academy looked like because I think a lot of our current students, yeah. even people that have trained even just in the last 20 to 25 to 30 years here sometime through that process, they don't realize what it used to be like. Mm -hmm. They come in and they see mats and these uh, very, very nice large schools. Um, so tell me a little bit about what that Wood Square original location, 
uh, L-shaped building. Is that correct? Well, I don't even know what it was back then. But anyway, just tell us about that location and just the, the atmosphere and maybe a little bit about the first bunch of students that you signed up and, and how that made you feel as you had your first, your first student, sir. Well, the, the, the first academy was 1,800 to 2,000 square feet. It was the, the typical re rectangle. Uh, you, you walk right in the door and you build a little L office uh, that has no top on it, so there's no privacy. There's just a closed door there that you sign people up. You have a stretching bar, and then you just look down the floor, and that's the floor. You put a couple of chairs up for uh, parents to sit in uh, that eventually became parents. So obviously there was no children taking class in, in 1981. If so, they were very few, uh, none in Tuscaloosa that I was aware of. Then, um, you know, we, we did all of the work. Uh, I had orange carpet and where the seams had come undone, we put gray duct tape. But you know, it was about um, just the training aspect. I don't think people thought anything about, because there wasn't that many commercial martial arts schools around. And the, just the look and feel was dungeness, if you will. It was not bright and beautiful like the academies of today, but they were functional. We had, eventually we get to weld a, a pole from the ceiling and run it through the drop ceiling and put one hanging bag on it and now your guys academies are full of these beautiful bags hanging everywhere or, or they're movable and you can replace everything but we just had that one so um, that was that's the way it started and the first group of students were guys we we're in a college town obviously and we started getting some college guys in for our day classes we you know some police officers and firemen were some of our first uh, adult students and you know that all went about that way adult students until uh, you know some of the movies started happening that started affecting the children uh, being interested in martial arts. So it's 1981 you're the manager of this location you've started signing people up uh, but I'm sure in your mind at some point in time you're like man this is a great job this is cool um, at what point in time did you really realized this could become your school and then when did you have the opportunity to actually purchase the school from your instructor sir yeah i don't know which came before the, you know which <laughs> came first um i think i was so wrapped up in you know trying to teach and finish projects that were going on in the school it was really really fast um certainly fast in today's times but um i think within a year Mr. Collars just said out of the blue, um, you want to buy the school, the academy. Uh, he's gonna, he had some other projects that he wanted to work on at that time, and I think he felt comfortable that that one was on its way. And, you know, we had several adult students, and we were growing at a pretty good clip. But um, I said yes before I probably knew what I was doing, I, you know. But uh, I just couldn't believe that you could actually make a living doing this, and that probably if – if I couldn't have made a living, I'd still found a way to do it because I was so passionate about it at the time. So the driving force was not owning the business as much as it was, was just to keep teaching martial arts. And if that meant that's what I had to do, then that's what I wanted to do. So I did, and he um, worked with me on that. Obviously, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to have the money and things, so he was gracious enough to help me get through that process. But I can tell you very clearly, the first time the landlord walked in and said uh, he's there to collect that rent check, uh, it became a whole new uh, meaning to me. So uh, not wanting to let Mr. Collars down, not wanting to let uh, Mr. Munford down, which was the guy that gave me this opportunity to rent the, the space in my own name at 21 or so years old, uh, was incredible. But it changed the responsibility level, and then it became a job, a job that I love, but it still had uh, responsibilities that needed to be felt. So that's probably 82-ish going into 83. Uh, and then 1984, this Mr. Miyagi thing happens. Mm. And so Karate Kid comes out. You have pretty much had just mainly adult students. And then Karate Kid movie comes out. Thank goodness it did. Yeah, <laughs> and so that really transformed the landscape of martial arts in general as a marketable product for children. Um, even though in the movie, they were still high school kids. 
but even just the name Karate Kid brought in a different aspect to it. And so uh, tell us a little bit about what started happening after the Karate Kid movie. Um, I didn't start martial arts personally until 93, so that was even, I mean, I was still in 84, I was nine years old, I was in a town that didn't have martial arts, um, and we'll get more of that later, but uh, just what did that do to the martial arts landscape when Karate Kid came out? Well, every phone call, and the phone started ringing a lot, was, do you teach children? And that, today, you know, that's unheard of because that's the first thing you think is going to happen when the phone rings. But there was this great interest. You know, what was it about? Are you going to teach my kid to hurt people? And are you going to do all these kinds of things? But there, the phone was just ringing um, incredibly well. And, you know, once you would bring those kids in and you had an opportunity to get down on their level and the parents saw that this was going to be okay and our teaching methods were um, although they are different, uh, the way we handled things uh, maybe then, still the parents put a lot of trust in us and it grew at such a, a, a rapid pace that we went from that 1,800 to 2,000 square foot uh, up into the corner 5,000 square foot facility just within a, a couple of years. So we were totally blessed by that movie and uh, the opportunity for children to come from everywhere. So transition from initial spot, 2,000 square feet-ish. Now you're in a different spot, same shopping center, 5,000 square feet. Program continues to grow, different people now look at you and they're like, hey, this guy's got an amazing job. He loves to come to work every day, loves to do what he's doing. And so you had started building at this point, five years, et cetera, and building the student base um, and then probably similar to what Mr. Collars did with you, there were people that you saw potential in. Um, and so what's going to be challenging with this is try to go through every single name of all the different people. So I'm just going to hit some highlights um, real quick of the process. In Alabama, we talk about the process okay. a lot, right? So uh, the process of that, um, obviously people will come in and, and you gave people the opportunity to come and be employed by you. Um, but these things called clubs existed. And so um, not dance club type clubs, martial arts clubs, which I actually started in a martial arts club in Athens, Alabama. Um, the main instructor was in Decatur and that's where I started in a very similar setup, couple of nights a week, part-time instructor comes in, can make some additional money. So hit, hit me a few of the highlights of some of the areas of around Tuscaloosa where you then established clubs, where were those clubs kind of taught so that we could expand out to a greater market than just Tuscaloosa um, with the footprint of martial arts here? Well, we had, we had this plan that, you know, you're working your way to black belt and as you're working your way to black belt and you show great deals of responsibility, then you could take one of those students and help you with some of the kids classes then and those students could obviously uh, demonstrate a technique and the child could watch them so it just gave you another set of hands inside the classroom on, on those children well the more those young adults or older adults even got that opportunity i think they felt some of the things that i felt that they were helping that they were being a part of the school as a contributor that they were uh, loving the opportunity to work with children. And so the opportunities started to come up because we had all of these adults that were continuing their training to now reach outside. We'd have phone calls from Gordo, from Centerville, from Demopolis, from Greensboro. And although many of those people tried to come and take an hour drive is, is a stretch uh, to make it three, four, five, six times a week, which is very common back then to train every single day. So uh, we would take those guys and put them in a, a schoolroom at, at their elementary school. We had cafeterias that would allow us to uh, have a club there a couple nights a week. Gymnasiums, obviously, armories we had, National Guard armories would allow us to do that. So those range from, you know, Demopolis to Greensboro to Moundville, Gordo, um, many, many clubs. Uh, even as far away as Thomasville at one time. So, uh, but then that was the catalyst really for these young guys to get teaching experience and then say, sir, can I do this? And so that would give us the opportunity to 
put that first uh, academy with one of our students in Meridian, Mississippi. So um, this is going to be the awkward part for you probably. So you were student, became instructor, but what you always absolutely loved, still love to this day, impressed upon us to love, is that you're an artist first. It's not a businessman first, it's an artist first. And so tell me a little bit about your competition years. Um, those are things I didn't get to experience coming into this town later. You were already done with your competition years at that point in time. Uh, and so tell me a little bit about competition even as a colored belt, but then what that kind of came to. What were the tournaments like? We got a, a, a trophy hanging back here behind us. Our students wouldn't have a clue what a trophy is now because years ago we said, hey, we're not going to do trophies anymore because if people travel from across the country, they got to try to get those back on airplanes. So we transitioned to medals, those type things. Just tell me a little bit about the competition, where competitions took place. Um, I know you're not going to want to talk about your competition record because I'll just talk about it, it was you were feared and nobody wanted to compete against you. It was just one of the things. Um, but what was you did back then? There were two competitions, forms and sparring. Um, there's not the the variety of things we have available for the students today. You did your form, you sparred, and then you won a lot of trophies. And so uh, I assume it was trophies when you first started. Uh, and then just tell us a little bit about what competition meant to you. That's a really open-ended question. Just go wherever you want to go with it. Well, you know, again, what attracted me to martial arts was this competitive side of me that I don't know that I could have identified it as competition. I just needed to feel like I, w I had a coach. I had a task that I had to do, and my work effort uh, determine how well I did at that task. I just needed that push somehow or another and martial arts just fulfilled that in more ways than I could ever imagine. But, you know, competition, I wanted to do that long before I, I wanted to do as an instructor. So I even said once to Mr. Collar, sir, I just, I, I just want to compete. All I want to do is compete. And he taught me a very important lesson at that point when I said, sir, I just want to spar. And that's really where I found the, the most challenge. That's where I felt uh, the most excited. And, uh, but he taught me very clearly. I said that to him and he said, and I repeated it to all of you guys al along the years, is that our students will never compete in just sparring. You'll compete in form and sparring because one benefits the other. And you can't be good at one without the, the benefits of the other. So we bought into that and uh, we just made sure that we passed that along the way. There was, what I remember about competition is uh, the butterflies, the nervous stomach, the anticipation, which was the same feelings that I had before a football game. And it was just something that drove me. But I remember, you know, the, um, the great competitors that I got to compete with. And those guys drove me, the Ron Almonds of the world that were just, um, talk about somebody that wanted to spar and was, you know, a thumper, a great representation of what martial arts was back then. Um, so knowing that you had the chance to compete against someone like that made you train even harder. And so there was no, well, I may do it or I may not. That you knew that if you didn't do it, that you would be embarrassed to come, you know, Saturday to the competition. So um, we did that and we traveled as groups, as guys. We would pile in. I tell people about it now and it almost seems archaic, but six, seven guys would pile into a vehicle and go down to Gulfport, Mississippi share a room together and we're all laid out all over the floor and then the next day we try to beat each other's brains in <laughs> but but we were buddies and then after that the fun part of going out and having dinner together and hanging out as friends and then we'd go back to our academies and then we'd meet up again and try to do it again several months later so uh, the competition part was fantastic you know the days of competition were we would start in um, malls, if you can believe that. So the malls or the in, inside malls of the time had long corridors and we would have rings down each. There was no matting like we have today. Duct tape formed the ring and you know if the fire marshals came they, you'd have to s separate the crowd and then they would leave and we would come back in again and fill it back up again. And then those events kind of went to 
uh, indoor basketball arenas where there were several thousand people in as spectators and, you know, two or three thousand competitors over a two day period uh, in all levels from all the way up to adult. And then we had high rank testings there, which were also, um, you know, a part of what just drove us is the opportunity to spar at that next testing. And anyone that was behind you coming to your level, you had an opportunity to introduce them to, you know, to some fun stuff. And that's just what drove us back then. So we enjoyed it. I'm glad, I'm glad I got to do it. Next off, I want to transition a little bit away from the martial arts aspect of it, sir, to things that have obviously impacted your martial arts, but that is your family. And we know how, I know personally how important family is to you. Um, so a little bit of background, as much as you want to give on how you met your wife, Kelly, uh, and then BJ and Tyler, your two sons, Brett and Tyler, uh, being born, how that impacted your martial arts world. Uh, because obviously you've always told us that you're going to become tremendously better instructors once you have kids of your own or you have kids that you've taken care of because it just changes your insight on how you're working with children uh, and how you care for other people's children when you know how much you care for your own children. So um, when did you get married? Then how quickly did y'all have children? And then just a little bit about the Bailey family unit. Uh, and then obviously that's going to affect more conversation about this as your two sons have now taken ownership of two of the schools here in town. So we'll get to that later, but just tell us a little bit about that. Well, some really good friends introduced me to my wife and uh, that was, uh, believe it or not, I was doing a demonstration in uh, McFarland Mall here, a local mall that we usually did at least once a month, if not more, that we would go out on Friday nights and do these demonstrations. So. A couple of good friends brought Kelly down and uh, obviously she watched part of the demonstration now when they get there and then, you know, we, gosh, we got married um, eight months or so after that. Um, and then, you know, it probably uh, has been so impactful on the business because, you know, she's one of those ladies that is willing to be um, behind the scenes let me do my thing in front and she knows what I need. And, and so she's willing to uh, be patient and give me those things. So uh, obviously I don't think that we could have ever grown our companies and been where we are today uh, had the good Lord not sent Kelly because I'm not sure you know how, how many others would be willing to do and go through as you well know. Um, when you're a business owner, Certainly when you become multiple business owners and uh, you need a support system and she's been my biggest support um, th through all, all of the years. So, um, and next year will be our 35th wedding anniversary. So um, she's been there all along. Uh, I, obviously speaking as someone that's experienced that, um, again, when I moved here in 98 uh, and then started operating an academy for you in 99, um, when you say behind the scenes, she is very involved but as you said, she's just not seen. And so she's always at events to be supportive of those things, but she's helped with a lot of, uh, of the, some of the book work, business work aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, her background of, uh, I think she wor used to work at the telephone company and do some different things with that. And uh, anyway, so she's got a lot of things that she added to the table, but she never just really dove into the martial arts side of it herself, but has been so impactful with the families and the students and the different things um, being involved, um, but again, was always um, just so, so supportive and has always and continues to be so supportive of that. Um, shout out to Mrs. Bailey. All right. Um, so then marriage, then tell us about first child born. Well, greatest, greatest ever thing. As you know, uh, when that first child comes, um, it's the only child that has ever been born on the planet, <laughs> you know, but uh, um, what pride we had in that. Uh, BJ now now kind of goes by Brett, you know, he's got his own wife and family and uh, two kids. And so so we're excited to be a part of that. But, you know, it, I, I remember clearly uh, when I went back to work, um, just driving under the, on McFarland Boulevard, the train, it hit me how much more responsibility that I had and what was in front of me for the next uh, 18 years or, or more that 
my responsibility was just not about me and, and then me and Kelly, it was about making sure that we did the right things so that they could have an education, an opportunity to have an education and do uh, the things they wanted to do that maybe we didn't necessarily have the opportunity to do. So um, it changed and as you said about teaching, I didn't always understand the answers I got from some of the children's parents about why they weren't there, certainly why they weren't there on time, uh, how often they participated, uh, what they were eating when I would see them eat and those kinds of things. But when I became a parent, I realized that um, there's, some, there's some challenges with children that you have to go through. And sometimes uh, we should just be thankful that the parent got the child to the class that day. And then how we interact with those children and, and how we motivate them or inspire them to learn. It's so many different ways with each different child. And I think if I hadn't been a, a parent and didn't have my children, that I probably wouldn't have really looked into that side of teaching as much. So, you know, a couple of years later, Tyler comes along and, and they're so opposite. Uh, you know, you don't even know that they're the same children necessarily or come from the same family. But um, BJ wasn't uh, a risk taker and was a little bit more um, slowly analyzed and moved this way. And the BJ, Tyler was wide open, just whatever it takes, let's just do it, you know. So you had to learn to deal with both children and you know, we made some rules around. They both started when they were four and five and years old. And we just said, look, we just have got to make a commitment. No different than we ask our students. So at least two times a week, you have to be there regardless of no matter what. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, my kids were in classes. Uh, they were with me for a long time. And then certainly I, I dumped them on you as fast as I could get them over to the Northport location um, because I think they I wanted them to see uh, the character that we had in such great instructors and, and the role models, not just dad's responsibility, but our team's uh, responsibility to teach all the kids. And I think that was a, a benefit. So uh, that's certainly been uh, a great, great blessing. So people would operate clubs uh, and then that's kind of the, the training ground for them then to go out. And so you said Meridian, Mississippi was a, a location that one was one of the first ones that was right. opened there. Um, again, it's going to be challenging to go through and name every person that's been opened and, and in the, all those cities. Uh, but I just want to make so so it gets across to the audience that's, that maybe is going to watch this, the number of people and the number of cities impacted the people that you've helped realize their dream to then go and have this as their job. And so um, the number's above 20 at this point in time of people that that's happened with. And a lot of them are gonna watch this. And um, But the cities and, and areas reached, and again, I'm just gonna run through them and if anything pops in your head. So Meridian, Mississippi, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, then we've got uh, Columbus, Georgia. Uh, other cities, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, the Atlanta, Georgia area with multiple locations, Lexington, Kentucky, Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, multiple locations in the Kansas City area at this time that you've helped open up. Um, well, I know I'm missing Huntsville, Alabama, um, has helped operate some in the Birmingham area as well with different people over taking over some different schools and different things. Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, I, I, I probably missed some through that process, but all those cities have had people that have come through here, gone out and opened their own locations. And, and some of those under the Tiger Rock brand, and then some of those under the what it was originally called, Taekwondo Plus. And so uh, everything here, again, when I moved here, it was when you answer the phone, it was Bailey Taekwondo Plus, how may I help you? And then, of course, that transitioned into Bailey's Tiger Rock. And now we just kind of say Tiger Rock Martial Arts, how may I help you? So just a little bit of the transition uh, on the business side of it, because while also operating your local academies, which grew from a Tuscaloosa location to then a Tuscaloosa and a Northport location in probably 19, late 80s, early 90s, um, the Norport location to open up in, in next to AG Chiropractic and then moved over next to CC's Pizza where it was for five or six years before it 
move to the existing building that it is now. Um, and so not just focused on the local academies, not just focused on opening up and helping other people within the academies, you were given the opportunity nationally by the leaders of what at the time was the International Taekwondo Alliance, which was branded kind of as Taekwondo Plus, to actually take some leadership nationally. So I know you don't want to talk about yourself in that way, whatever, but just give a little bit of background in your 40 years of here, how that's not just expanded, how, how it's not just been locally, but how that's expanded and you had the opportunity to then be a part of the national scheme of what has become the number one martial arts franchise in the country, Tiger Rock Martial Arts. Well, that's a that's a lot of <laughs> stopping. A lot of talking. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff in there. But just being fortunate enough that um, you know that we really really took pride in what we were doing here, and that pride um, kind of went out to these other guys who who adopted that way or that process that we talk about, and and, and they became more successful. So. You know, the family tree kind of really, really grew and, and we became, um, you know, important not only to our own facilities, but there was importance to the regional operation that was going on. Then it, then it grew uh, to the national operation. So, you know, a, a good friend and not a great martial arts owner and, uh, you know, we just asked God be with him at this point, but you know, our good friend, Mr. Conway, he and I were good friends and business um, associates at the time. And we, you know, we had some pretty successful um, lineages. And then we got to be a part of, you know, what is the leadership. And that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have, you know, great people willing to allow us to participate in that. But um, by doing that, it's caused our whole, uh, organization to become Tiger Rock today and it's giving many many people the opportunity that a few of us got back in the 70s and 80s so uh, you know we're just thankful to Tiger Rock as a whole for you know what they've done and 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 what we've become and uh, you know we're making a difference not just as martial artists and I think that's the thing that a lot of people really still don't know about what what we're about but you know we had a, a set of tenets that we live by and we really really tried to live by those ten commandments if you will of how we conduct ourselves as martial artists and as people uh, whether it's in the classroom or in the world how do we conduct ourselves that we're going to stand out in a different way and um, you know I think that really caught on and and people really uh, you know, we had oaths that we would take and we would say those and recite those and mission statements that we've created that helped us all stay on the same page. And although we have our own dreams, we all had the same kind of goals. And, and so we're achieving those today, um, you know, at a pretty successful rate. So let's fast forward. You've got, mar you're married, you've got the kids. Uh, BJ and Tyler both started, like you said, at age four, age five. Um, this college grad student moves to Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. in 1998. Uh, that would be me, and uh, had already was a third degree black belt in our organization, Taekwondo Plus ITA. Moved here, and I just wanted to train. I'd seen you at tournaments and do, doing demonstrations, and I came from a, a an academy in the Athens, Alabama area where I never would have realized, hey, I could actually do this as a career, feed my family. But I was, man, I was, I was in it. I loved it. I loved kicking and punching. Uh, my instructor, even back then in Athens, at Red Belt said, hey, Michael, you're going to start teaching classes on Saturdays. Gave me a key, and he didn't show up. Um, so was already a certified instructor, moved down here. Um, and even though we say everything is exactly the same at all the areas, it wasn't a franchise model at that point in time. But I moved here, and it was so eye-opening. Um, uh, just from the first classes and workouts. Um, I even I remember one of the first staff workouts I came to and I had the opportunity, the pleasure, whatever you want to call it, to spar with you. And man, again, if y'all might look at him now at 61 and be like, what? Anyway, but uh, you just didn't want to stand in front of him and spar with him. Uh, and again, I'm six foot three, five foot, Nine, Nine um, you know, it, there was never a challenge too big. And so, like, his goal 
obviously, I mean, he, he didn't have a goals probably. He was just like, I'm just going to spar you because he could do whatever he wanted to do. Um, but I made the mistake after one workout, sat down, I go, Mr. Bailey, like, why is it so hard to spar you? <laughs> I just stuck my foot in my mouth because it was just like, He's there, then he's over here hitting you in the back of the head with this technique. And again, this is even at in 1998. So at that time, I'm not going to say you weren't in your prime, but really, it, I don't know when your prime ever left you, but if it even has. But, um, but the reality is he was in his 40s at that point in time, and it was just amazing to, to witness and watch and stand in front of um, and have the opportunity, the privilege to spar with you, train under you, those type things. Anyway, so I moved here, um, and then Brad Fantle was who was operating the, the Northport location next to CC's. The transition was going to happen. You had purchased some land and built the, the building where the facility is here in Northport at that point in time. <clears throat> and so for Brad to be able to go to Tallahassee and open up there, he needed somebody to take his spot here. And so Brad and I were friends. They've been nudging me, hey, Michael, you want to do this? You want to do this? With my background, this was not what I would wanted, had planned to do, but realized under getting to meet you and realize, man, you could actually do something you absolutely love and are passionate about and make a decent enough living to support your family to do that. Um, and so in 1999, you gave this guy that you'd only known for a year uh, the opportunity to pretty much partner with Brad in, in operating this location and he was here for very short like two or three weeks and then he moved to Tallahassee to be able to operate what's now the Norport Academy and it became a full-time abs absolute school. It was already a school but like a large plush really nice place so we had the location in Tuscaloosa on 13th Street which was now your own building that you had built. We kind of skipped over that a little bit but you moved out of the Wood Square, built a building there on 13th Street and then you had the Norport School it continued to grow. You're like, well, I think we've got a, a space for another town, another school in town. And so you opened up a location um, sometime shortly thereafter on the south end of town in, in, in a very developing area of town in Hillcrest at that point in time. And so I would say early 2000s uh, when that Hillcrest location was opened in a strip center down there. Uh, so now we had kind of a triangle on the town, three locations, <clears throat> both all of them growing. I think at, at, at one point, the biggest, uh, if I run back through all the numbers, here in town, we had upwards of 700 actively training students between the three schools. So it went from one location, which I don't know what the biggest it ever was at the Wood Square location, <clears throat> but you realize you couldn't still, even though with those outside clubs, you couldn't really influence as many people as you could with the, the benefits of martial arts until we actually had three locations and then it just continued to explode. So 700 plus students training. Then in 2011, things got weird in Tuscaloosa. Yeah. So on April 27th, um, this very large EF four or five tornado comes through, <clears throat> through downtown and um, hits the 13th Street location. So I'm just gonna let all that up to three locations, tornado hits, two just, locations. it became two locations at that point in time since it destroyed that one. So just talk a little bit about the tornado, the recovery, um, how that affected you personally. You weren't in the schools anymore every day teaching classes, but, um, your son was operating one of those locations. Anyway, just talk about that a little bit and um, let's just call this segment the tornado. Yeah, well, lots of things that you said there that I'd like to go back and touch on each of those, but you know, one of the, you know, the greatest uh, gifts that we probably got in Tuscaloosa was when you came to Tuscaloosa. So, uh, and I think that shows by, um, you know, not jumping ahead, but you having this opportunity to be here because of someone that I truly valued the way you lived your life and conducted yourself as a human being, not inside the classroom as much as outside the classroom. So uh, that was impactful. Uh, but the tornado was, um, you know, it's one of those things that you, 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 it really pushes you back. So you have goals, obviously, as a martial artist, there is never a time when you're not striving for a goal. 
and you establish those. We every year established our own personal goals and then we had our academy goals and w then we said what's the plan to make that happen and we're so detail oriented and we you know everything's got a checkbox and we do this and and it becomes instinctive and automatic and we were way ahead of our personal plan uh, when that tornado came and that tornado obviously uh, required us to demolish the 13th Street location, which was originally the, you know, it's the home, it grew into the home place, the original school that we had. So uh, it was emotional for a while and it was just one of them things you go, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I want to rebuild. I don't know if um, it's feasible to rebuild with all of the regulations that were being changed and all the things going on. So it became just a challenging time, but we knew we had a responsibility to the people there. So fortunately, those people, some came and trained with you and some came and tra trained down at South uh, with our other team down at that location and that got us by. We immediately started trying to find a, a fill-in location and somewhat central so our parents wouldn't have this burden of, of driving all over town and which was the original region that we have three locations anyway is to try to be accessible. Um, so we, we found the spot, a little bitty tiny spot and a in a retail center that was basically becoming abandoned and, and dying out. But we got there, it was central located. Uh, as you said, my son was trying to run that location at that time with, with um, Justin Hubbard, who is now in, in Kansas City. And, and so, you know, they were doing the best they could, but they were young guys and they really didn't have a lot of experience at that time. So we were trying to, you know, just shuffle everything to get it done. But uh, someone wise said, look, go for it just go for it and you know we did all the right things we had insurance and we had um, the things that we needed to do we had to go back in debt to do it but we built that facility uh, it was uh, you know one of the you know classy little locations that uh, we were able to put together with the tiger rock um, uh, format and design kit so it really looked good and we built that to be able to service and be a training facility for all of our instructors who would come in from the other towns that you've already mentioned uh, and get continuous training and so we took great pride in that so uh, tornado was the tornado and the thing that we met to mention the most is that 55 people lost their lives in that that deal it was not just a tornado that tore up a school it's ripped up a great deal of the town I forget the numbers whether it was a third or whatever the, the city was uh, destroyed and many many people lost their lost their lives and although we could rebuild some of them couldn't rebuild those things so it's always you know got a place in our heart that um, we'll never forget what happened that day and and the new location was one of the first <clears throat> yeah. buildings actually rebuilt again to the city code dotted the I's, crossed the T's, and it was one of the first things that actually went back up. And uh, I, I like to think of it as a beacon of hope for the community uh, and the fact that it did go back up. It got back up as fast as you could get it back up um, through that process, so that's awesome. All right, so about the same time in life as the tornado came through, there was a pretty uh, significant situation in the Bailey family with your wife being diagnosed with cancer. So. I just want to talk a little bit about how that affected uh, you personally, your, your, your family, uh, the businesses, and just let you talk about that a little bit, sir. Well, talk about kick you when you're down, huh? No, so the tornado and the cancer was all in that same area there, but um, you know, we knew something was going on. She, she knew more than anyone else that something was going on and continued to have, you know, things come up and then, you know, finally we did a biopsy and, and, and realized that she had Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, and so that set out for, you know, um, some tough times. And, but, you know, she was a champ and she, she battled through um, chemo. And, you know, we got to some times when we really got concerned, but she bounced back each time and, um, you know, got better and better. And, 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 and I would say then, you know, the Lord knows when, th when you can handle these kinds of things, I guess, because um, if we didn't have the kind of staff team that we had, uh, I'm not sure if we could have survived that because I needed to be available for her and, um, you know, do the treatments with her and make sure that, um, 
you know, that her needs were taken care of at that time. And, and of course, she was fighting as, as, as much as she could, as, as many, many, many people have. But um, it, it affected us a lot with, you know, the kids and first one thing and another. But we had a great team that took up my slack and uh, continued to work. So the business, you know, I don't, I don't know that the business, any of that missed a beat you know, that they allowed me the time that I needed to be able to be with her. And uh, so, uh, but hey, great news that she whipped that and um, uh, she's been uh, cancer free for over 10 years now. And, and so we're just in, enjoying our life and that second opportunity that we have together. Uh, so currently, if you snapshot 2021, three locations still, existing and operating here, Tiger Rock locations in town, but you don't own any of them. Mm. Uh, so in 2007, you sold me the Norport location. Uh, what an honor that was to be able to purchase a school in your actual town and, and have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and then, as you mentioned earlier, time of the tornado, Brett was managing that location at that point in time. Fast forward a few more years, Tyler becomes the manager of the Hillcrest location. So now um, myself, Brett, and Tyler are operating those academies in town. You're still having lots of interactions with us. Um, and then just in the past few years, you sold the Tuscaloosa location to Brett and the Hillcrest location to Tyler. Just as a father, so take off your yeah. business owner hat, put on your father hat, um, the family business kind of being handed down and um, that's just not seen a ton in the martial arts world. Uh, it's tried to be done out there in a lot of the business world, some successfully, not some, and some not successfully. Um, so just speak to that. As a dad, uh, what made you decide to do that? How much of an honor is it that your kids would like to follow in your footsteps to do what you've always done? You know, our family doesn't know anything but martial arts. That's 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 all they know. They grew up, and you know, we used to tell them early on that that Bailey can name can be a curse or a blessing. It's just really going to be up to you and how you look at it. You know, so we we um, we were always together. And one thing about Kelly again was that um, you all can attest that she's only missed one tournament in our 35 years she travels everywhere uh, that I'm required to travel even now in the business travel when I'm doing things with with Tiger Rock she's still right there with me and I think that set an example for BJ and Tyler that you know it was special and and they were a part of that specialness and both of them are good athletes so um, you know, they could do anything they wanted. Tyler worked with the Kansas City Chiefs for a bit, doing a, an internship there after he got his exercise science degree. And we thought he may go off a different direction, but, you know, he just he kept coming back to saying, I think this is what I want to do. I want that thing. This is what I want to do. So for me, you know, it was, um, you know, certainly emotional, impactful that your sons would want to do what you want to do. But, uh, it's a challenge now as to, to do that. And, you know, I, I worry that they have to, you know, again, they're always Mr. Bailey's sons, you know, but things are starting to happen now where when I go around, folks don't know who I am and they call them Mr. Bailey. And uh, so uh, they're, they're making their own way and they're doing that in a way that pleases them. We are different, obviously, as human beings. They do things a little bit differently, but uh, they're finding success. And um, I think the three of y'all make good city partners. Wouldn't have it any other way. So over 40 years, things have changed. Whether that's what we wear, whether that's uh, what the academies look like, uh, all these different things. So again, I, we've got some just things blast from the past out here. All of our uniforms used to have uh, patches that came with the uniform that then had to be sewn on. We had to send them off to get them sewn on if a parent didn't know how to sew and sewing like, doesn't exist anymore in today's world. The back actually had embroidery that went on it that the uniform was sent off and embroidery work was done. Um, so just from training aids to attire, to the academy look, just talk about the evolution of things over 40 years. And that's a pretty open question. Well, I, th I think that you have a lot, 
right here behind us, but many, many things have changed. But I think that, that, that old saying, less is more, is really what we've become. Whether it, in the, in the old days and behind me, you have the, you know, the uniforms that were made out of a heavy canvas that felt like 20 or 30 pounds on you to this lightweight, um, stylish uh, uniform that we wear now. They still have representations of, of uh, what we do and who we are, but uh, it's just less is more. It's, it's less for the parents to have to worry about and, and all the sewing that was required and keeping up with championships and patches and, and all of these things to, uh, look, let's keep the main thing the main thing, and that's the training the benefits of the training, the opportunities that we have to compete and defend. And so that's really what we are today. And so although it looks really, really good, uh, you know, we're even, um, you know, saving trees. So uh, in my day, this and your day, even we were breaking boards and to test the power of a technique. And and then that came to a plastic board, uh, certainly. Uh, we thought the world was going to end when we talked about that, but it became such a uh, level playing field because this was so inconsistent and this became very consistent. And then now even the safety for even the holders. And in my day, you never worried about the holders. It was just about the boards and the breakers. So uh, less is more, less is more in the classroom. We used to have to know hundreds of techniques and multiple forms, 21 to 24 forms, as you can see in videos. And you don't have that now. We know what works. If you watch a fighter in the ring, he's gonna go to certain techniques that he feels strongly in. And those techniques can be practiced through our form pattern now, the, uh, the whole on 55, and then through the, the flow drills that we do is, is done to make uh, instinctive memory happen faster through repetition and disguising of repetition. The bags we can place all over the floor. We even have in-home training aids now that a student can connect with class, with his classroom and a Zoom uh, experience. Uh, who would have thought that 40 mm. years ago? So um, I like where we are today. Yes, sir. All right, uh, Faith. So I know our relationship and, and just the time that we've spent together and you've been such a mentor and a father figure to me in so many different ways. Um, and I know what faith plays a part with you. And so just want to give the opportunity um, cause this will go, th this may be something your grandkids watch years from now, um, or tomorrow, who knows, but, um, speak a little bit if you want to, to, um, your faith and just how that plays a part in your life. Well, I, I'm certainly a, a, a work in progress and, and I think that's the way it is it's meant to be, but, uh, I can't, uh, think that I would be in this position and I would have the benefit of thousands of students um, and those students being such a class representation of our martial art, I just don't think that would be possible without, you know, God in my life. And, and so I think that, you know, I'm thankful that uh, I got slapped around early on and realized that, you know, I'm, I'm a country boy from Alabama that um, probably was going to do what other guys did. And, but for some reason, I, I got this special path that I got to walk on. And so, you know, I, I have tons of mentors and I have tons of people that I think were possible in that. But I think if it was not for uh, God's will, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened, period. So... I'm just thankful that for that, and I hope that the way that you know we treat people, the way uh, we've treated people over the years, is is the biggest message. That you know that we're all the same and we're all searching for something, and that something uh, for me was martial arts, and then that something became capitalized when you know I asked Jesus to live in my heart. So. All right, sir. So I just want to say thank you first off for everything, <laughs> like. I wouldn't have any of this opportunity in my life if it wasn't for the opportunity that you gave me to do this as a career. Um, and so thank you for sitting down and, and doing this. I know it feels weird, but um, just the opportunity to sit down and just 
history is so important. Again, if we don't know our country's history, our world's history, um, and so we want our students, we want uh, future students to just know the history of, of where this product came from, this program came from, uh, and again, it came through the fact that back in 1981, your instructor asked you to move to Tuscaloosa and open up locations here. Obviously, um, your instructor, Craig Collars, his brother, Bert Collars, uh, their dear friend and, and one of the leaders, Art Monroe, Marv Conway and yourself are kind of the guys that founded Tiger Rock Martial Arts out of the International Taekwondo Alliance. Um, obviously, Mr. Monroe has passed away at this point in time. Uh, what a, a tremendous martial artist and tremendous man he was and an influence on all of us. Uh, and so obviously wanted to make sure that we mentioned their names as, as a part of this process. Uh, but anyway, I just give you the opportunity in closing, anything that you would like to say, any closing comments that you might want to touch on. Well, I think you did there. I think the people that are most important for me to, for us to remember is that um, I had an instructor too, and that instructor gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, you know, I ask him at times, why, why did you do that? I mean, what did you see when other people had actually told him that um, I probably wouldn't be the best investment, but he didn't see that. He saw something different. And, and that's really all we need is someone to believe in us and someone to give us an opportunity. And he did that. So I'll, I'll be forever grateful, Mr. Collars, for that opportunity. And then, as you said, Burt Collars, Art Monroe, and my friend uh, Marv Conway have been so instrumental in um, teaching you and leading you and just being there for you when the times weren't always, always so great. So thanks to those guys for being there. And then, as we've already said, just being blessed with such great students that become instructors and, and now partners. So that's fantastic. Yes, sir. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed watching this. Just to give a little recap, uh, 1981 to 2021, celebrating 40 years of martial arts in the Tuscaloosa and Northport area. We hope this is a treat for all of our students, past students, current students, future students, just to document a little bit of the history of what's happened over the last 40 years uh, through the influence of Mr. Bailey and the martial arts world here in Tuscaloosa. Thank you, sir. Thank you.